Christian Parks. I appreciate you all coming. Um, I'm Linda Kuhn, I'm Dean of the Honors College, and every semester we do our signature seminar series for which students do have to apply because we like to have a small group and a mix of majors. Bad medicine was so popular that we decided to run it again. And yes, for the pre-med student, it is a boon to writing a provocative and erudite proposal to go to med school. But I would say for any student, this is a truly exceptional seminar. But before I introduce the mas mistress of gruesome, like what a master, you like that better, okay. master of gruesome, I'd like to give a little commercial for our subsequent sneak previews. We're doing four seminars in the fall. And a week from today, Professor Heim Goodman Strauss will be doing little things that change the world. <laughs> the string, the haircut, the um, plastic, you, you plastic say, bag. plastic bag. Little things that have had either a massive bad impact on humanity, who have a relationship to evolutionary history, to have a prehistory story and are absolutely fascinating. So students are going to look at the way look, look at the ways in which little things have massively transformed our existence. This is part of the hippest part of the history profession right now. Thing history. Isn't that right? Yes. yes. Sexy. <laughs> Followingly, join us for Animal Minds. These are all on Wednesday, same time, same bat channel. So our third one is Animal Minds. Ever wonder about the emotional life of dogs? <laughs> the intellect of octopus? <laughs> Join us for something crazy. In fact, there may be animals at this meet preview. <gasps> Philosophy, cognitive science, psychology, <coughs> um, you name it actually, this discipline speaks to you. Animal science. It's going to be a super interesting class. He's going to do all kinds of species, but he is a dog expert, so, and share the philosophy <laughs> part. Who knew? And finally, rounding it out, Dr. Lisa Corrigan from Communication is going to do intimacies, race and sex panics in American history post-World War II. Super provocative, always disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> the surveillance of African American leaders by our government and why focus on private lives. This is part of the larger conversation in American rhetoric about panic. <sighs> I'll take all these. But now, <laughs> you guys gotta take this one. <laughs> this one is classic. Dr. Trish Starks, who is a historian of Soviet Union, who is a great medical historian, and dazzles with the current seminar on addiction. It's always grim with you. <laughs> <laughs> but actually has developed a brilliant series of lectures and classes related to the history of medicine. But for the Honors College, of course, it's history of medicine at its most despicable, depressing, loathsome, depraved moments. And let's face it, that's why you're here. So I'll turn it over to the master of the gruesome. Let's give a hand for Dr. Trisha Stark. We're going to be very bad today. And I think we're going to need some kind of absolution. Now, we used to call her when she was chair of the history department, the abbess. Now that she's a dean, and that we need some true absolution, we need a sacramental here. Okay, second. Let's... Oh, what is that? That's the pop of white smoke. <laughs> <laughs> Now let me turn it over to, I didn't expect that one, Starks. <laughs> Woo! Thank you so much. I'm glad 
glad you're here. I'm going to talk for about 30 some minutes about kind of a background of the class. And then I'll give you a little bit more about the interior of the class. But I want to set the stage. The class itself starts, starts with the scientific revolution. It starts way back. It starts in the 16th century. A period when Europeans are encountering the world with new eyes. They have been inspired by the Renaissance, by the research and reattention to the classics that had come with the Renaissance, looking back at the classical Greek, at Arab mathematicians, at new ideas of science made available because of the linguistic turn of the Renaissance. And they are confronting these ancients and coming up with new ideas based upon scientific method, about or observation, about looking but like Copernicus looking up into the heavens, and like Vesalius from my class into the interior of the man. Looking within and seeing there things that had not been seen before, things that were different. And Vesalius was truly brilliant at this. He was, by the age of 23, he was a professor of surgery at the University of Padua. By the age of 28, he would come out with one of the most important books of medicine for the next 200 years, The Fabrica. An interior look at the body based upon large numbers of anatomical um, investigations, unprecedented in its detail, and also combined with beautiful artistic renderings of the interior of the body. He had befriended artists in Venice, in Florence, and asked them to help him describe the interior in a way that was very similar to the way we study today. Presenting the body in a logical order from the skeleton outward, correcting misunderstandings that had been there since the first century BC, since the third century AD, things that had been out there for ages. It sold out rapidly. Students were particularly interested in cheap in, uh, reproductions. They would cut out the uh, placards and put them above their dissection tables and use them for years afterwards. He truly set the stage for scientific discovery of the anatomical uh, structures of man for the next several centuries a detailed visualization of not just man, but also amazing for the time period, of woman. Unlike many, he had access to female cadavers, too. But it was more than most. Most cadavers at the time you only got through um, public execution. <coughs> Somebody that was going to be damned in the afterlife, it didn't matter if you cut up their body. They didn't have to be in full for the resurrection. But he had two females, and he looked into their interiors, and it was truly revolutionary, hugely influential, regarded as a grand achievement, and rightfully so. The fabric was beautiful, cleverly done, artistically drawn, pieces of art in their own right. But my class is not <laughs> about the grand, the historic, or the heroic. It's going to be about the tragic, the misguided, the regrettable. Bad medicine is going to be about how, when he looked into the interior of woman, he was blinkered by his prejudice. And we're going to look at how science is often a creature of its time. That scientists are regarding humankind in this period according to their images of what should be in terms of sexual difference. They were guided by the ideas, and Vesalius in particular was guided by the ideas of the classics regarding male and female difference. For him, man and woman were the same sex. It was just that woman was a cold and wet humeral version of a hot and dry male that males were hot and dry. That was closer to perfection, closer to the, to the ether. And women were fecund and earth-like. 
And so he saw when he looked into the interior of female, a man inverted. Because instead of her hot, dry heat pushing out her sexual organs, because she was cold and wet, it was sucked up within. And so when he saw the vagina of his female, he saw that thing up there on the right. Doesn't look like a vagina from your anatomical textbooks today. He saw a male pulled inward. He was blinkered, even with these anatomical examples right in front of him. He saw what he thought he was going to see. He saw an inverted male. Hugely influential. The female genitalia were seen in homology, the same organs as in male, but within a different system. The female as inverted and imperfect, as cold and wet, as just a male, not yet. However, anatomical knowledge is going to change, not because of new bodies, not because men and women change massively physically, but because the political, social, economic system around it changes, and science changes with it. The impact of what we call the dual revolutions, the French Revolution of 1789 and the Industrial Revolution of the 18th and 19th century, is going to change the way anatomists regard the body. The Industrial Revolution brings with it all sorts of things. Mass urban migration, hyper-urbanization, urban disease, the rise of capitalism, but also the management of populations as a resource. Because you need labor in an industrial capitalist world. And labor has to be healthy enough to work. Because you need more bodies in a nationally competitive world so that they can go out and help you retain resources. The Industrial Revolution gives change to the social and economic. The French Revolution gives change to the intellectual and cultural climate. The Enlightenment brings us the ideas of Locke and Diderot, of Montesquieu, of Jefferson, and the idea of the inalienable, bleh, inalienable rights of man. The French Revolution elevates not just these natural rights of life, liberty, and property, but also the idea of health as a human right. That health is something that states should secure, but also something that citizens are obliged to take care of for the protection of the state. It is the rise of what we call in Foucaultian terms, the rise of biopolitics the management of the body as part of the duties of the citizen, the interest of the state in a comely and well-maintained populace. It elevated also the social sciences so as to take care of these people, to number them, to um, do surveys of them, to understand birth and death, morbidity and mortality. Medical authorities became tools of the state in this quest. They were part of the political, economic, and martial power. They staffed and informed the bureaucratic structures, and they used medicine to surveil people and make them comely citizens. In turn, states gave doctors immense prestige and power and access to enormous numbers of cadavers, which they then look inside and see something rather different than our poor Vesalius earlier. Impacted by the ideas of the Industrial Revolution and the French Revolution, impacted by the ideas of natural rights, they look to the natural world to give form to the political, social, and economic environment in which they live. Science becomes a tool for finding natural reasons to maintain the gender and racial power structures that it had lived with before for biblical or ideas of blood right. Now we look to the body, 
We look to nature to settle up ideas of humanity and where they belong. This goes all the way down to the botanical level, all the way down to our ideas of genus and species. Linnaeus, the botanist of the 18th century, who gives us our nomenclature for the um, classification of the world, settled upon the name for the human class of mammal. It's an odd choice mammal, based upon the idea of lactation and the mammary, which is only functional in half the species and only for a limited time within their life. Why not the hairy ones? Why not the three boned ear ones? He settled upon a name that signified the natural place of woman and put her within the bestial world classificatory system. And we move out from there to even discussions of how plants and animals behave, putting them within the same ideas of how man and woman should behave in the social world. Monogamous mating, the lifelong affairs of different birds, become the romantic points for discussion in science. When we move to the interior of the body, we see sex and race now placed into the very flesh and bone. This is a set of illustrations by Barclay, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Barclay in 1829. Very different from Vesalius, wouldn't you say? Instead of the same skeleton, he has a different skeleton for both man and woman. And if you look at that woman, she is rather oddly shaken. <laughs> Look at her head. Look at her hips. Put flesh upon her body. Look at her ribcage in comparison to the male. These are not the places that we usually would see differentiation, but I mean, there are differentiations between the skeletons, but not quite like this. She's a pinhead. Look at her tiny feet. Look at her. Her, 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 her skeletal, her, look at her ribcage. He looks at the skeleton. By the way, he doesn't, Barclay didn't like get, you know, massive numbers of skeletons, average them out and everything. He would go and he would look at a bone and go, this one's very pretty. I'll use this one for the skull. This one's very pretty. I'll use this for the femur. This one looks like what the Venus de Milo looks like. That's what the average woman should be. That is our classical female. That is the epitome of female. Going back to Greek sculpture as your model for medical texts. But not just that is there. Look what else he overlays within this figure. Look within the background. He's putting both male and female within not just the natural world, but also commentaries about civilization, about usefulness, about the social places of male and female. This isn't just about skeletons. This is about the entire order of Europe. What is the male? Tell me. What do you see within the male as echoed with his animal background? A noble. A no oh, I like that. He's noble. A noble steed. He's a noble steed. What else? What do you associate with that, that noble steed? He's productive. He's productive. He's useful. <clears throat> He's powerful. He's strong. He is used for productive labor that is outside of the home. Look even behind him. There's a little farmstead in civilization. Look at Tinhead over here. <laughs> <laughs> what does she have behind her? An ostrich? An ostrich? What? You can women take their head in the sand, right? That's yeah, I, well, I don't even, you know, it, it's an early period for <laughs> encounters with the ostrich for the European. I think it's just like, these are really exotic and weird. Let's put that up for their uh, female, yeah. <laughs> what do you, what do you, what do you, when you look at this, what do you think of with the ostrich? Brains, productivity, 
Feathers in the cap. Feathers in the cap. The only thing I can think of in terms of productivity of an ostrich in this period would be fashionable accoutrement. Look at the proportions of that bird. Come on, tell me. What's important about that ostrich? Big yeah, she's got a big pelvis and a tiny head. Those are good women right there. Bursting and not thinking. And long legs. And long legs. <laughs> <laughs> she has much bigger feet. Than the, uh, she has a super elongated yeah, an elongated neck, a tiny head. They believe they they argue that her her um, rib cage is so diminished because she doesn't breathe heavily like a man because she's not rugged. You know that's why it's so. It's probably because corsets, but you know eh, we'll go with she's just not strong. Even look at her shoulders and the breadth of her shoulders. Even her posture. She's holding a flower. <laughs> And what's behind her? Trees. Trees. Doesn't even get a. She doesn't even get the small amounts of civilization. She is outside. She is nature. So even though we've gotten rid of a lot of our humoral medicine by this time, by the time they go inside the terrier, they're like, oh wait, no, it's not four humors. That doesn't work. I don't see. A, I don't see black bile in there at all. I don't even know what that is. They just have to go back to a new site, but they see the same discriminatory things that they wish to see. Oh man. And they take it with them. Because that scientific revolution of looking up to the stars allowed them also to go across the oceans much more efficiently. And they take these same ideas about inferiority and being, seeing their social necessity within the science and add to it a vision of race. Here a later, um, what would become later a eugenic staple, the idea that the African was closer to the ape in development than the European. Well before Darwinian science. There were arguments about whether Africans were truly human within European society and science. So it's not just discrimination against women. It's not just an, a, a, an attempt to keep the social order through science and nature. It's also a racial order, and one that is expansive and goes with that benevolent medicine wherever they encounter. Anatomists found difference in the skeleton, in the body, in the flesh, and communicated it to medical science and practice, and it became a foundation for social, political, and economic order. The scientific revolution gave tools to the European to explore the world, and they found within it deficiency and difference their own supremacy. Bad medicine, of course, follows these questions. The definition of natural rights, the delineation of sexual and racial difference, the rise of biopolitics, the finding of natural deficiency within male or within female and within other races to see how medical ideas of race, sex, and disease were employed to define certain groups as more bestial, less developed, and therefore less worthy of humane care. A look at how medicine was used to define behaviors of peoples as unhealthy, and therefore subject to medical and state intrusion. This is not about malpractice not those points where medicine could do nothing and therefore was powerless. It's not where medicine did harm through ignorance. This is a course that looks as those points where the state, science, and medicine united to use their power to do harm. It's bad. Medicine. 
It's when authorities decided that patients deserved harm, were impervious to harm, or were so dangerous to society as to merit harm. It focuses on those episodes when cloaked in the idea of therapeutics, when we try to push for more productive citizens who conform to European racial categories, when we physicians will be used to diagnose as disease deficient, abnormal, or aberrant those outside the norm. The first part of the class goes over what I just did in much more detail and much more gruesome episodes. The unit I call The Citizen. And we'll read fantastic books and discuss them. This is not a lecture class. I will not talk this long ever again in the class that you take my class. I will force you to talk about what you encounter in books like or pieces like that of Michel Foucault, who discusses biopolitics and how medicine is used to groom citizens and get the most out of them. And works like Bakur, who talks about that entire thing about heat and dry and wet and cold, and organs sucked in and spewed out. It's a great essay. And Lon Scheidinger, who looks at Linnaeus' work and has the most fabulous line I've ever seen in a book. Mr. Treat, uh, or Dr. Treat has been there. Let us turn now to a cultural history of the breast. <laughs> it is divine. And Harriet Washington. And this is a new book to my lineup. Used it last time I taught. It's outstanding. It's a book called Medical Apartheid. And it looks at medical science's use of African American bodies from the antebellum period to the present. Stories like that of the gynecologist, the guy, founder of gynecology, Marion Sims, who um, created the episiotomy surgery for um, perennial tears. He did it by experimentation on slave women without anesthesia. Multiple surgeries, one went through, I think, 19 surgeries. just tore a statue down of him in New York City. But she'll talk about a lot of those things. Over the entirety of the period, I had to put that one down a few times. We'll explore the female and how women are defined as inferior medically, socially, culturally, intellectually, through science, and how that is used over time. Laura Briggs, who looks at this in terms of race. Fran Bernstein, who looks at it in terms of gender. And Elaine Showalter, a new book for me about the origins of hysteria. Hysteria was the belief that the woman's womb ran around her body at night and tried to suffocate her. And that's what made us crazy. Um, there were so many remedies. None of them very pleasant, shockingly. Third unit, we'll look at how this is used as a class-based um, system of oppression. How do we think about scent in the working class with Alan Corbett? Beautiful book, so stinky, fantastic. And Fausto Sterling, David Horn. David Horn is a it's a book on criminology and how they tried to type the the criminal body so that you could just look at a person's body and its structures and decide if they were a lifelong criminal or an atavist. And you could just incarcerate them right away. Why even wait for them to grow up? Or whether they, whether they blushed or not. What were their thresholds for pain? Do you have a lot of tattoos? You're a born criminal. We're gonna incarcerate you. All within the ideas that are put forward in criminology. You know, four, we look at more gruesome things. People that are seen as deviant within the social and economic order of especially the 19th century. Those involved in non-reproductive sex, homosexuals, 
those who are outside the norm in terms of um, gender uh, submissiveness, suffragettes, and other women who are uh, too, too uninterested in male authority. We'll read books by Peter Allen, who looks at disease and um, especially syphilis over time. Dan Healy, who looks at hermaphrodites. Susan Sontag, who talks about disease and its implications of shame. Jennifer Terry. This um, work in particular, the um, Dan Healy and the hermaphrodite, opens up all sorts of ways of discussing how can medicine be both helpful and harmful. How is medicine used? When is treatment actually more punishment? We spend a lot of time with syphilis in this unit. Finally, we end with eugenics. The decision to sterilize or even euthanize those that are not conforming to the needs of the modern state. And we don't just look at Germany. In fact, we barely look at Germany. We spend more time with the 60 to 70,000 people that are sterilized in the United States. Guess what? It's mostly women. The more intrusive surgery. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. The decision to sterilize women who are seen as outside of the norm of behavior. And diagnosing them when they're outside the norm of behavior as being imbecilic, Moronic, Let's see, yeah, idiot, imbecile, 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 moron. I can't remember which one's at the very top. And how these categories are used to punish. We leave for that Wendy Klein, who looks at just the United States, Robert Proctor, who is a historian of medicine of Germany, and Harriet Washington. Americans and how they are um, sterilized within the systems. It's not terribly upbeat, <laughs> but it is exceedingly important because unfortunately the tragic, the misguided, and the regrettable are not just in the past. We know that today these issues are still problematic for medical was a survey taken of medical students in 2016 about racial difference in medical care. It was not based upon any science that was out there, but based upon prejudices that have been long baked into the system. And it is these things that then mean that when African Americans come in for care, they're less likely to get pain medication. They're less likely to get, they're less likely to be listened to. It's the reason that when women get in for care, they're often dismissed as, they're not having a heart attack. And are also less likely to get painkillers. There are long baked in prejudices about women and ethnic minorities that affect the way that we and that's my selfish purpose for making this class. I hope that you will go out there and become better consumers and or providers of medical care. But it's also something that you selfishly, if you're going into pre-medicine, should think about. Because this class gives you excellent stories for your med school interviews. It gives you something that makes you stand out and if you like this class or like these concepts, I also urge you to think about our medical humanities minor. If you haven't heard about it, come up and talk to me. You can get that onto your transcript and it'll show that you're encountering not just biology and OCHEM and all the rest of that, but we are also thinking about the implications and the great deal of harm that can come with medicine as well as health.
questions? Yes, So does science or does medicine affect society more, or does society affect medicine more? I think I think it's cross pollinating. I mean, doctors are we are a part of society. I'm, a, I'm not that kind of doctor, but even as that guy, as this kind of doctor, I'm affected by the society around me. It's you have to break out of those blinders. I mean, again, looking up at what Vesalius saw, you know what he saw. It was in front of him, and yet that's not what he saw. And actually, he's not, Leonardo da Vinci also did numerous um, investigations of the interior, including the interior of female. When he drew the uterus, he drew horns on the thing <laughs> because he was so influenced by the ideas of the classics that he thought it was a beast that roamed the body. And so it creates, the society creates the scientists that then look within and create science that then reinforces the social. And they always come up on top. Those scientists, when they look in, those white guys looking in, they see the same things that they want to see. And that's why it's, it's so important also to try and integrate medical science and the sciences more generally. It's because it's only when we become part of the system that we can change it. But excellent question. Um, <laughs> that's an excellent question too. How did I become interested in biomedicine? I started off by wanting to watch, so the Soviets have a mass immigration of peasants in the 1930s as part of Stalin's industrialization plan. 10 million peasants come to the city in a five year span. Most of them are fleeing the countryside because it's awful. But they come into the city and I was just like, how do you learn how to live in a city? You know, how do you learn which side of the street to walk on? How do you learn how to line up for the bus? All of these things. They didn't have, I found one article on how to line up for the bus. Most of the stuff was about, can you just wipe the crap off your boots before you come in? There was stuff about making sure you took off your muddy clothes before you got into bed at night. Making sure that you brush your teeth. How to go and evacuate your bowels. All sorts of hygienic information. And then I was like, oh, well, that makes sense. 10 million people just descended on the city. I bet it was filled with refuse. And so I started to investigate the propaganda and became very interested. And the Soviets had the first national health care system in the world in 1918. And now I'm working on tobacco. They had the first tobacco cessation campaign started in 1920. They had the first nationally funded tobacco cessation clinics in 1926 and they would double lifespans within 20 years. So, kind of coming from there. And now I just can't get away. <laughs> yes? Do you cover um, sort of how religion affects medical thought? That Peter Allen book, he's a um, homosexual male who lived through the AIDS crisis and lost a partner. And so he goes through um, diseases from Love sickness, hysteria, neurasthenia, masturbation, syphilis, all the way to the AIDS crisis. And there's a heavy dose of religion throughout all of those. Sure. Yeah. And so, really dealing, especially with homosexuality, we start to talk a lot about religion. But yeah, that's an excellent question. And I should mention that I will be doing a Ollie version for this, also a 290 Ollie version. So, if you have parents or family or people on the outside, you know, civilians. <laughs> um, they'd like to take a version. I'll be doing that too. Um, would you say that like um, prejudice and like panic contributes to like bad news and like would you counter bias? I think yeah. I think very much panic. In fact, one of the things we'll talk about with hysteria and the worries about white females becoming fragile and very um, weak in the 19th century is that they are contrasted with African Americans and Irish and East Europeans who are supposedly incredibly robust women and just give birth and go right back out into the field, whereas our white ladies are all fainting on the couches and our numbers are declining and they're rising. There's all sorts of racial panic going on behind these images 
what's going on with white women. So, yeah. And white males and their virility. Because even though they put that, that, that lovely stallion behind him, they were worried he wasn't. <laughs> worried he was perhaps more ostrich. <laughs> <laughs> And this is your second time teaching the course. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how the course has differed from mm -hmm. uh, your original uh, presentation of it, or, or what the first iteration of the class uh, taught you, and, and uh, what you changed to reflect that in this this class. I have um, I have changed up. I've changed up my books quite a few of them. Um, I've also the Harriet Washington, the first time I used it, we only did it in two days, and it really is such a disturbing book that I've now spread it over four days. Um, Marion Sims, not only does he do um, surgery on slave women without anesthesia, he also decides that the reason that African Americans are inferior is because the children's skulls are fused when they're children, uh, and the baby's skulls are fu fused, and therefore, he uses cobbler's tools to break apart the skulls so that the skulls will expand correctly and they'll be of similar mental. Yeah, I had to put the book down for a while after that one. And I share it all with you. <laughs> when was the ether first invented? Ether's first used in the mid-19th century, and he could have used some. There are there are arguments, oh, he didn't, there wasn't any painkiller. He could have used and there were, yeah, there are variations of it, but he believed that African Americans did not feel pain because they were closer to beasts, and beasts don't feel pain. We have an entire book. Oh, yeah, we have an entire book on childbirth and how women don't feel pain because we're closer to beasts too. And the birth of the Lamaze method. The science of going African American in pain was on NPR today. It was about now. <laughs> so. I know it's not up to but it's really fascinating, isn't it? You could spend a day, you could spend a semester doing bad stuff. And again, she'll give us absolution when we're done. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it doesn't work without the hat. The hat's too good for me. <laughs> Treat helped me pick it out. He knew which colors it needed to be. <laughs> Any Any final question? questions for our awesome historian of medicine? Yeah, I was wondering what kind of contention coming users face when it starts to change, like the perception of like previously held, um, and how exactly they want to fight that, and how many years it's going to start. <laughs> the anatomical, like perception, yeah, that, yeah. You, that you were mentioning with the female skeleton. Yeah. So I think it's, it, it somewhat parallels like the climate change right now, uh, where like, I don't know how long it's going to take to necessarily change people's perceptions about it, or what it will take they don't. Within like the history, like how does it, two things that are uh, important in that, and that's an excellent question, two things important in terms of making that change in science and making that change in medicine. One is integration of the field, and um, two is, and I just lost it. Um, <laughs> one is integration of the field, let me start with that one, is that women are denied entry into medicine until the late 19th century, and even then they have a lot of discrimination against their entry into the field. and. Same for um, people of color. And so those two things, uh, that, that keeps people from being involved. The second thing is the lag, the time lag. That most of the time, people that are being educated in medicine are being educated by people that have been educated, you know, 20 years, 30 years previously. So it just takes a long time for things to catch up on. Because we educators get kind of comfortable in our ruts. Sometimes we don't update things as much as we should. And so, yeah. And so it can be, in, and even med medical educators, you know, just think of the expense of doing a new textbook. And yeah. so there, we have an article that I use in the class that just talks about updating of textbooks yeah. and how many textbooks use the mail as the standard and how long. How long you'll just see, you know, how many times you'll just see a, um, thing about muscle structures in the arm or something, and they'll use a male figure.
just as a default, and how women are even kind of an aside there. Yeah. So we talked about all sorts of things along those lines. But yeah, it does take a long time. And part of it is integration of the field, but all it's integration of all levels of the field, yeah. from educator to practitioner, to patient. You know, patients being educated in what they're asking for. Wow. <laughs> Let's give her an awesome round of applause. private questions about the course or about the medical humanities or even the Osher lifelong learning class. So have at her. Come She's, on up. She won't bite. I'm not as scared in real life.